Okay, uh, do you hear me? The back? Yeah, okay, thanks a lot, Nathan. So it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, thanks a lot, local organizers, for organizing this school on amplitudes in, uh, in Brazil. And uh, I will be giving uh, some uh, general introduction to uh, modern amplitudes methods. You will have other lectures or more detailed directions of research. So uh, this will be very general, but we will kind of go a particular path into uh, discussing uh, the amplitudes and what has been interesting, why people are interested, are interested in this subject, and uh, what are the new methods beyond just the standard textbook uh, approach to calculate amplitudes. But let me first start, because people have probably diverse backgrounds, uh, just to review in the beginning uh, some basic aspects of scattering amplitudes, what they are, how people normally calculate them, and uh, uh, what happened basically in the last 30 years, that uh, there was need, need and desire to develop some alternative routes, how to do the calculations. So, uh, As Nathan said, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's important that if uh, you ask questions, whatever you want to explain more or don't understand or you disagree with me on what, what I'm saying, yeah, please uh, raise your hand uh, and ask or debate. Uh, I will uh, also give some exercises probably more in the second lecture today because I have two lectures today because in the first lecture I will be introducing uh, some uh, formalism and uh, and so on, but uh, yeah, I will also leave some exercises that we can then discuss uh, in the in the uh, afternoon uh, session and yeah, the exercise session. So I just want to add there are people, some people on Zoom, so you're welcome also to. You yeah. can raise your hand. You can send by chat. You can open your microphone, whatever you want. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> okay, so our object of interest is a uh, scattering amplitude. in the context of quantum field theory. And uh, this is a mathematical function, we will call it A, which will depend on certain data, kinematical data of uh, particles, which uh, describe a scattering process. So uh, at particle colliders or uh, in different situations, we scatter elementary particles, different types of particles. Uh, they interact with each other, and uh, we get some result. Now, in classical mechanics, uh, uh, if you know the initial state, you know the rules, you will find the final state. So I'm just solving some differential equation, like uh, uh, calculating the trajectory of, some, uh, of uh, some particle. However, in quantum mechanics, the word is uh, not deterministic. So even for the same initial state, we have a bunch of final states that we can get. Yeah? So the, the nature is probabilistic. And uh, the scattering amplitudes, this function A, is our theoretical description what can happen in the end. Yeah? It's a probabilistic, uh, it's a probabilistic uh, uh, framework when for the same initial state we can get different final states. Now the scattering amplitude depends on these initial and final states uh, and uh, I write here some kinematical data, these are momenta of particles, so free momenta and energies. Uh, we are working in the relativistic theory so they uh, unify into uh, four momenta, and then some spin structure. Now, depending what type of particles, if we have scalars, fermions, vectors, gravitons, uh, the spin is described by different uh, spin functions. Yeah. Uh, we will actually use uh, uh, kind of definite spin states. We will use helicities and so on, but we will get back to it later. So far, I just leave it as some information about the spin and possibly some other internal degrees of freedom. Yeah. Okay, so this is, this is the function that we would like to predict, we would like to calculate. Uh, we are theorists, we would like to calculate this function. And then uh, this function then enters uh, 
this we cannot measure itself. The amplitude is not something you would measure uh, in any scattering experiment, but it enters uh, the, the thing that we can actually measure, which is a cross-section. Okay, and uh, the cross-section sigma actually corresponds directly to this probability that for a given initial state we will have, for a fixed initial state we will have a given final state. The thing which is typically uh, defined is the differential cross-section, which is directly up to, okay, I will just write proportional, because there are also various uh, factors, is proportional to the square of the amplitude. But uh, in this part of the calculation, what we will do in this lecture, and what uh, is kind of, uh, the thi this is the uh, output of mo what most people do, is to calculate this amplitude. Once you have the amplitude, you square it, you put it in the differential cross-section, and then you have to integrate over the phase space, which is another complicated thing to do, but uh, it uh, boils down. This is mostly done just uh, numerically in most of the cases. Okay, and this is something you can actually measure. Yeah, Let's say at colliders or uh, other people applying to also gravitational physics and, and so on. But uh, this, uh, our... Uh, the thing we will be here interested in is the amplitude. So how to calculate amplitude? So how to calculate A? So there is a standard and correct answer to it. And this is uh, a method of Feynman diagrams. Developed by Feynman and Schwinger, Dyson and others long time ago actually partially indirectly pioneered by Dirac in 30s, and then, of course, Feynman in 40s, 50s, uh, and uh, others. And uh, uh, the starting point is the theory in which we would like to do the calculation. So we have uh, certain particles we scatter, uh, the way how they interact, how they uh, talk to each other, is given by the Lagrangian in quantum field theory. So we start with Lagrangian, The Lagrangian tells us uh, how the particles interact. So let me give you an example. Uh, so this is uh, what you find in any standard quantum field theory textbook. Let's say we have just a scalar field. So, and we can have phi cube interaction. Or we can work in quantum electrodynamics. And, uh, and have some interaction of, uh, oh. okay. fermions and uh, the intermediate uh, photon. Okay, I should write higher than this. Okay, so from the Lagrangian, we derive our Feynman rules. So uh, it's basically diagrammatic, so we draw all the ways how the particles and they interact. So for this phi cube theory, which is just a theory of a single scalar, either the particle can just propagate, or three particles can meet in a point. Yeah? So this is our basic interaction. This is just a propagation, this is not an interaction, but this is the interaction that we have in the theory. So for the QED, uh, our pictures is either a free propagation on a fermion, so this is now a, this is a scalar, here we have a fermion, or we have propagation of a photon, the particle that mediates uh, the electrodynamic interaction, or the photon uh, can interact with the, ferm with the fermions in uh, this three-point interaction. And uh, from these elementary vertices, we build Feynman diagrams. 
And the Feynman diagrams is actually an extremely nice uh, Uh, extremely well, well, nice diagrammatic way how to do the expansion in the amplitude in the perturbation theory. So this is one thing which is important to mention. Uh, so uh, uh, if we have the Lagrangian, which describes some weakly coupled quantum field theory. So we can have theories which have very weak coupling or very strong coupling. If the theory is strongly coupled, then this formalism does not work. Yeah, we cannot calculate amplitudes like that. Yeah. But if the theory is weakly coupled, the coupling is weak. Uh, this is exactly what this formalism is designed to work. We can take the amplitude, which is now some function of, uh, of a coupling, and expand in the coupling. So here I denoted the coupling lambda. This, this, this is sitting in front of this three-point interaction. Here I denoted the coupling E, which is basically the electric charge, yeah. which is sitting in front of this interaction. Now, uh, we have A, so, uh, so then the A is expanded. There is a term which has uh, terms which have different power in uh, this coupling. Yeah, let's say, uh, yeah, there is a, OK, ju here, just schematically, we will do explicit examples later. Yeah, let's say we have a term which is proportional to lambda square and lambda to the 4, lambda to the 6, and so on. So this is perturbative expansion. And the prescription is that uh, so we can, let's say, put uh, some, uh, some coefficients, which are our amplitudes that we are going to calculate. And the prescription is that uh, uh, each term here corresponds to the sum of all Feynman diagrams. So each amplitude is a sum of all Feynman diagrams, which have a different given power of this coupling constant. So how do these Feynman diagrams look like? Let's do it on this example of the, uh, let's say, the quantum electrodynamics, the interactions of the electrons, positrons, and, uh, uh, and photons. So let's say we calculate an amplitude 2 to 2 in QED, electron-electron scattering. So EE e goes to EE. E. So at the leading order, the Feynman diagram is extremely boring. Yeah, there is no interaction at all. Yeah, the two electrons just freely uh, propagate, and they don't talk to each other. OK, we typically don't consider that diagram because it's just yeah, equal to 1. Now, the first interaction looks like this. So the electron propagates and exchange one photon. Yeah? You see, because we said that in each of uh, these vertices is sitting one power of E from the Lagrangian, then uh, this diagram is of order E square, yeah, or lambda square, if we call it lambda. But then we have more diagrams which have just more interactions. Yeah, so, for example, they can exchange two photons. Yeah? Now, there are four interaction vertices here. So this is proportional to E4. And we have more of these diagrams, yeah? and so on. So the rule is that uh, we always take all the Feynman diagrams built from these elementary pictures, stick them together in all possible ways you can. Yeah. This is just one way, one diagram that we can draw. We can draw some other diagrams, which will have also four vertices here. And you sum all of them. And that's your amplitude. Now, you see here some clear hierarchy. Yeah? There is actually, this is a trivial part. 
there is this leading term which had only two powers of this small coupling. Yeah, now it's expansion in this uh, coupling constant E, we consider E to be small. So this should be a dominant term, this should be a subleading term, sub subleading, and so on. It should be an expansion. Now, uh, if you look at these diagrams that you can, uh, get, then uh, there, is, uh, there is a hierarchy in terms of the number of these vertices, but at the same time, there is also something about the topology of these diagrams. This diagram doesn't have any internal loop, while this one does. So the perturbative expansion here is a loop expansion. We call these three, oh, three level diagram, while this is a one loop diagram. It has one internal loop here. Yeah. There will be also another diagram which will have two internal loops. Yeah, this is a two loop diagram. And you see that now there are six of the interaction vertices. So it will be proportional to e to the six and will be even sub sub leading. Okay? So, uh, so the perturbative expansion in the coupling constant is a loop expansion of scattering amplitudes. So we are getting uh, to this hierarchy of uh, the loop expansion. So the amplitude can be then expanded as a tree amplitude plus one loop amplitude plus two loop amplitude and higher and higher orders. Now, the idea is that uh, the tree level is the dominant one, then one loop gives some correction, this gives a smaller correction and so on. The number of Feynman diagrams that fall into these higher and higher loops is huge. Yeah, the, if you just imagine uh, diagrammatically, the number of things that you can possibly grow, uh, draw will grow extremely fast. Yeah? So the higher and higher loop calculations will become less and less tractable, just because even without doing any further calculation, just drawing these diagrams. Yeah? Behind each diagram, there is some formula. There are these Feynman rules, how to turn these diagrams into formulas. OK? Uh, but uh, here in this expansion, each of the terms, we can think about it as some of these Feynman diagrams with uh, the fixed number of loops. Yeah. Okay, any questions here? before we move farther. I guess for most people, it's, uh, uh, they already uh, seen it before in the textbook. Ah, question, yeah. Uh, well, we don't know a priori, so we have to assume it's weak. So yeah. try to repeat the question just so people... Ah, okay, know. okay. So, so there was a question, if I just have a Lagrangian, how do I know that the coupling is weak and I can use this perturbative expansion. Yeah, well, you have to assume it. Yeah, so if the coupling is uh, large, you just cannot use the perturbative expansion at weak coupling. Yeah, you have to use some other methods, yeah. There are other methods how to do some strong coupling calculation, but they work for specific things. They are not, yeah, they don't fit into this framework. Yeah, for certain things you can say something, but in general, it's very hard to say something about strongly coupled systems, yeah. There are other ways using uh, dualities. Some strong, strongly coupled systems are dual to other weakly coupled systems. You can say something there. But uh, yeah, you have to assume that the coupling is weak. Yeah. Of course, the coupling is also not a constant. It's running. There are kind of more things behind it. But at least at this level, we just assume the coupling is weak, and we can do this expansion. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Well, uh, in the general expression, well, it kind of uh, depends exactly what is your interaction. Here you see that for QED, the nature of the interaction is that you have also only uh, the, 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 the even number of them. Yeah, 
Uh, now, in other theories, you can have also theories with multiple couplings. Yeah, then sometimes the, the given coupling only appears in single power or odd power. Yeah, but in the simple simple systems like that. Yeah, just the nature of uh, or just the diagrammatic nature of that tells you that oh, there is always a pair. Yeah, because if you have a cubic interaction and the thing is exchanged, you need two vertices for the exchange. Yeah, but you can also have a four-point interaction, in, and uh, if they have a separate coupling constant, they can appear in the first. Yeah, so uh, if you have multiple coupling constant, it becomes yeah more complicated from that point of view. Okay, any more questions? So this would be just a nice story, but uh, if uh, if uh, if this was all. Then uh, I have a process that I would like to calculate the amplitude for. I have a theory given by the Lagrangian. I do this expansion for each term. I draw all Feynman diagrams and evaluate them. I sum them and get a contribution. Yeah? The tree level would be the dominant one. There will be also fewest number of Feynman diagrams I need. In our case, there was only one. If you go to higher and higher orders, you get more and more precision result. Uh, but you have to draw all, you have to calculate more Feynman diagrams. So at some point, of course, you have to stop just because of kind of uh, the calculational uh, complexity. However, things are more uh, tricky and interesting. The amplitudes are not so innocent functions. Uh, they suffer from various problems. Yeah. So naively, I told you that this should be a smaller contribution to the final result than this one, and this smaller than this one. However, if you do the straight calculation, you get that, OK, here for fixed kinematics, you get some result, and here you get infinity. OK? And uh, this is because amplitudes suffer from divergencies. And these divergencies need to be regulated. Yeah. So this is something I just briefly mentioned here. Yeah, this, it's a more involved thing and uh, <coughs> uh, some topic that you can uh, study if you are interested. But uh, uh, just from uh, if uh, we just look at these uh, uh, Feynman diagrams which have loops, you see that there is some internal loop. But uh, the internal loop has also a momentum associated with that. These are external momenta, these four. Yeah? But there is also an internal momentum which is not specified. Yeah? So divergencies come from loops. So if we have some diagram like that, there is a loop momentum L which is flowing inside. And you have to integrate. The prescription is to integrate over this loop momentum. And these integrals are just divergent. And they are divergent in two different regions, where the loop momentum is small. Uh, it's a specific region where the loop momentum is kind of proportional kinematically to one of these external momenta. This corresponds to IR divergencies, infrared divergencies. And the other region where the thing can diverge is when the loop momentum is large. Yeah. And these are UV divergencies. Now, they, they are physically very different yeah, from the physics point of view. These IR divergencies is uh, an artifact of the amplitude. It's because we are not calculating the physical objects that you would measure, like the cross-section, but we calculated this intermediate object, the amplitude, which is a good idea to do for many reasons. But if you have massless particles, uh, the amplitudes are, are, are divergent. The UV divergence is a different story. That tells you that our theory is sick, yeah? that our theory is not uh, well-defined at very high energies, and there should be some UV completion, which makes the amplitude finite. Yeah, so this is a problem of the theory. This is a problem of uh, our formalism to describing, uh, to dealing with amplitudes and with amplitudes with massless particles, which is what we will do most of the lecture. Yeah, uh, this will eventually cancel. 
So this will then cancel in the cross section. The structure of these IR divergences uh, is very well understood. So despite we get them, we know exactly in which form they should appear in the amplitude. So we don't worry about them because we know that they should cancel. We can then also explicitly cancel them here, but uh, they have certain uh, uh, structure. These UV divergences are problematic. So once you have a theory with UV divergences, you have to do renormalization. If you work in effective field theories, you have to kind of add more and more higher derivative corrections and so on. So this tells you something about the theory. Now, uh, so these divergences appear. Now, we still want to get, not infinity, but some regularized answer. So uh, we have to regulate them. And the standard way how to do it is uh, work in dimensional regularization. When uh, instead of uh, working in four dimensions, we work in some shifted dimension, four minus epsilon, and or two epsilon, uh, and uh, then the amplitude becomes a function of this epsilon and will have poles in this epsilon. We'll go like one over epsilon square. 1 over epsilon. So you see that you cannot send epsilon to 0. Yeah. So uh, that uh, will capture these IR and UV divergences. OK, so this is just, uh, in my lectures, we will only work with three level amplitudes. So they will be completely finite, yeah, because there is no integral to do. These will be rational functions. Uh, but uh, once you start to deal with loops, you have to worry about the divergences. Yeah. And uh, I think Tzvi in his lectures will do some of the one loop uh, calculations, right? Okay, any questions about that? Yes? No, they also, uh, they also, uh, okay. So they also regulate UV uh, because certain integrals uh, uh, are basically postulated to be zero. <laughs> Uh, at UV, despite they are formally infinity. But uh, uh, so even the UV divergences are regulated. And actually, that's one of the problems of also of the dim rack. In case you have both types of divergences, UV and IR, you can have some accidental cancellations. They start to mix together. Yeah? And in the, f in, the cal in the physical calculation, you would like to distinguish them. So then you have to do more things in order to see how they differ. We know that this IR divergency only appears in theories with massless particles. So you, for example, can give a small mass to your massless particles. And then there are no IR divergencies, but your expressions will depend on this small mass. And if you send the mass to zero, you, you get an infinity. You get a pole. Yeah. Uh, Zoom questions? No. Can Zoom ask questions too? Um, now, uh, uh, there are always uh, kind of problems with regulating divergences because they typically break some symmetries uh, of, uh, of your theory. So, um, so even using DIMREC, uh, despite the theory has some symmetry, uh, and we will discuss a theory of gluons. There, are, there might be some symmetries of certain amplitudes of gluons. But once you go to loops, and uh, in that case, you have, for example, only IR divergences, but you have to regulate them, you break these symmetries. So it's always very hard to find a regulator which would respect the symmetries of the theory. OK. so. Uh, so this was uh, kind of the general discussion. And now, uh, this is kind of the, the standard stuff. But of course, there is much more to say uh, about, uh, uh, about uh, these things and also some of the more modern approaches or how people now think about. For example, about the IR divergences, really a lot is known. Despite they do appear in amplitude, so you might think that the amplitude is kind of little corrupted object because it has this uh, it has these divergences despite you know that they will eventually cancel in some physical object they are very well understood yes a ah, question 
Yeah, yeah. So, so IR divergences are basically related to the low, the low energetic region. They are related to the fact that if you have a massless particles, it costs nothing to emit such a particle. Yeah, you can emit a lot of massless particles with very small energies. So how do you tell that you emit it, that in the process you have one outgoing massless or million of them, if million of them have each just incremental small momentum? Yeah. So it's this soft emission which causes the problem. Yeah. Uh, but uh, we know that in the cross-section there is ex exactly cancellations of that between soft and, and the virtual and uh, they have to cancel. But indeed, they are related to the low energy region, while the UV divergences are related to the high energetic region. And uh, if they do appear in the theory, as I said, it just indicates that the theory that uh, you have cannot be applied at the high energies. Yeah, it must be modified. Yeah. Like, for example, gravity. Yeah. So if we calculate scattering of gravitons in Einstein relativity, you have divergences, uh, UV divergences that appear. Uh, there is a question about uh, if the supersymmetry can help to cancel these divergences. That's a question about the UV finiteness of uh, certain supergravity theories, which is still open. But in general, the, gravity, uh, the, uh, the quantum theories of gravity in the perturbation theory do have UV divergences. So if there are no more questions, let's now move actually to uh, starting to develop some formalism of how new ways how to think about uh, tree-level amplitudes. So here we restrict to the tree-level amplitudes. Despite uh, the first part will be just about kinematics, not about amplitudes. It would be just a way how to describe the kinematics of massless particles. So, and then we will use it uh, to develop some new methods how to calculate tree-level amplitudes. Okay, so uh, uh, as I said, uh, the external, uh, the, the incoming and outgoing states, so I call it external states, have some four momentum p mu. The amplitudes describe on-shell physical states. So uh, the square of the four momentum is equal to m square, to the mass of the particle. And in our case, the, the mass will be zero. Now, you can say, well, in standard model, many particles have masses. So isn't it like too big uh, kind of restriction or too specialization? In some sense, yes. From the other point of view, some particles don't have masses. Let's say like gluons, photons, or gravitons. And all other particles that do have masses, if you go to very high energies, that, for example, you scatter at LHC, their masses are negligible. Yeah. So, uh, but, uh, but yeah, it's in some sense, it is uh, some specialization, and there exist the generalizations to massive particles, but it uh, becomes slightly more complicated despite it does exist. Okay, so we have massless uh, particles here. Now, uh, Before we jump into developing uh, a spinner helicity formalism for how to describe these massless particles, let me tell you kind of the historic uh, motivation, Histo some story from uh, 35 years ago, why uh, scattering of massless particles, uh, amplitudes, uh, for scattering of massless particles are much simpler than one would expect. And uh, that, will, yeah, that will give us uh, a motivation to kind of 
try to pursue alternative ways how to calculate amplitudes. So, uh, so this was a kind of, we'll call it, let's say, early surprise in uh, studying amplitudes. And this come, goes back to 1985. Yeah, I guess uh, way back before m most of you were born. And I was two years old, so I don't remember it as well. And uh, this happened in the uh, process of studying scattering of gluons. So we will discuss the gluon, uh, gluon amplitudes uh, in much details later, because this is kind of one, uh, this is uh, a particular uh, set of amplitudes which are extremely interesting from the theoretical perspective, studying kind of new structures, new symmetries, new approaches, but also they are relevant for uh, QCD calculations. And that was also the reasons why people look at them before. Yeah, so uh, I don't want to go much into that, but uh, if you scatter protons at uh, colliders, at hadronic colliders, uh, the protons have gluons and quarks, uh, the particles of strong interactions confined inside, but uh, if you go to high energies, you can talk about amplitudes of these quarks and gluons. And then you have to, in order to actually describe what happens on the collider, you have to kind of turn the gluons and uh, quarks back into the hadrons use, using some parton distribution functions and some kind of non-perturbative QCD things we cannot describe well uh, analytically. But in the end, uh, like the center of that is scattering of gluons and quarks inside. And these things can be handled perturbatively. Yeah? And uh, that's what people basically did, is, uh, looking at amplitudes of gluons and quarks already back in 1970s. And uh, the motivation was uh, to do, uh, to just give these amplitudes that then they can be used at colliders, not LHC. This was back in 70s and 80s. Uh, but to kind of calculate accurately the QCD background of some new physics search experiments. And uh, these uh, amplitudes are notoriously difficult to calculate, even at tree level. So this is even about just the tree level and uh, you have a bunch of gluons in the initial state, and then you have gluons in the final state. And the number of Feynman diagrams is just too big. Yeah? So it's not like this QED when we had one Feynman diagram for this 2 to 2 scattering, but there are at uh, 2 to 2, there are only four diagrams, but then it starts to grow. There is like 50, 200, and it, it grows a lot. But these calculations were needed, so... Uh, uh, so people did the calculations of gl two gluons going to three gluons. And uh, it was already like 24 pages of algebra of uh, the, uh, evaluating these Feynman rules and writing uh, the explicit formulas for these amplitudes. And the next one was two gluons going to four gluons. Yeah, so we would call that five-point amplitude. This is a six-point amplitude. Because this pi, these are initial states, these are final states. Uh, because of the properties of the amplitude, you can turn all particles to be incoming or all particles to be outgoing. So the only invariant information is actually how many particles scatter, independent of their incoming or outgoing. Now, uh, this was also motivated by the fact that in the, in the US, in uh, early 80s, there was a plan for a new particle collider, uh, superconducting super collider, which was supposed to go to very high energies. And uh, if it was built, it would probably discover the Higgs boson in 1992 or something like that. But it was canceled uh, eventually in early 90s. Uh, but uh, the calculations for this QCD background for the gluon scattering was done. And uh, this calculations was done in 1985 by Stephen Park and Thomas Taylor. And uh, the straight result was 100 pages of algebra. And uh, in order to do that, uh, they had to evaluate 220 Feynman diagrams. And there is uh, their famous paper, or 
that one is kind of infamous, the first paper, uh, when they just gave this result as a 14-page uh, letter with some tables, some expressions, and they, they write that this is, uh, this is a result given to experimentalists for the fast numerical evaluation of this process. But then within a year, they realized that these uh, 100 pages, or they turn it into 14 pages for the paper, uh, can be simplified into a single line formula, which would be in nowadays would write like that, and this is exactly uh, written in terms of variables we will define in a moment. Okay, maybe I will write it more suggestively with one, two here, and one, two to the four. Once you see also this structure, you can kind of immediately try to generalize it to any number of gluons, and you will indeed succeed for certain special gluon amplitudes. You can write a formula for the scattering for arbitrary number of uh, gluons. But this showed, this is, this is something called Park-Taylor formula, based on the people who discovered it. But this shows that uh, the structure of amplitudes, or the final formulas, can be much, much simpler than individual terms that you get in the expansion in terms of Feynman diagrams. Because there, here, each Feynman diagram is like half page of the result. You have 220 of them. You sum all of them, and you get a one-line formula if you write it using the right variables. And uh, if you cancel all unnecessary things in between. OK? So this is just tree level. Yeah, this is just tree level, yeah. Uh, so then uh, the progress started at one loop in 19, early 1990s uh, by Zvi Bern and Lance Dixon, David Kosower, uh, when they used some improvement of these methods called unitarity methods that we will talk about to reveal also the simplifications at one loop amplitudes, not only tree level. But this, what I'm saying here, is just tree level. Yeah. Uh, yes. So uh, the thing is that, uh, okay, we will make it kind of more, more concrete, but the Feynman, uh, more question? Sorry? Ah, repeat the question. Yeah, can we uh, see, uh, or can we see how the cancellation happens in Feynman diagrams to give this formula? Very hardly, yeah. Now, uh, the reason for that is basically in the core of these modern amplitudes methods, because, uh, the problem is in the way how we describe particles with spin. So uh, the particles with spin in the quantum field theory, we describe using polarization vectors. But the polarization vectors don't really describe two helicities of the massless particles, but have more degrees of freedom in it. And we have to then impose certain conditions to remove these extra degrees of freedom. Now, each Feynman diagram, uh, is not invariant under this transformation, the gauge invariance that we impose, but only the amplitude is. So these individual terms kind of suffer from this kind of baggage of additional stuff, this which must cancel in the end. And this formula is directly formula for the amplitude, so it doesn't have any this extra redundancy that individual di Feynman diagrams do have. Now, the lessons uh, from this calculation was that in order to see the reveal simplifications uh, uh, of the amplitude and then also develop methods which would directly give this simple formula without doing this intermediate process and then trying to simplify things, which is kind of a hopeless, uh, otherwise hopeless activity, is to fix the external states. Yeah. Fix the spin structure helicities that we will talk about uh, also either this or the second lecture, fix the external helicities, and once you do it, then uh, the formulas becomes extremely simple for the final amplitudes. But this is something which is invisible in the Feynman diagrams, because the Feynman diagrams is, are designed to work for any helicity or any spins, spins of external states. Yeah. OK, but we will, we will get back to it later. And then, then this formula would make perfect sense. And you would then immediately write this formula as the only possible result for a given scattering amplitude. Yes, question. 
very, very good question. Yes, uh, the formula is different if the helicity is different. So specifically, this is basically for scattering to, uh, well, I still didn't, I didn't introduce what is helicity, but most people probably know. Uh, so if you scatter two negative helicity gluons and you have four negative gluons in the final states, once you start to flip some of these helicities to plus, the some of the formulas are even simpler because they are zero. So, but the, this is one particular one, but if you flip this to plus, uh, the formula is not a one, it's still a one line formula, but it's not a single term, but it's a sum of two terms. Yeah. And uh, the Park and Taylor ran into this formula because they exactly consider this process. Yeah. Now, if you actually do the real, if you want to then apply it to LHC physics, you need to know all possible helicities, yeah, or all possible combinations. But the lesson for here is that you should fix the helicities first, calculate the amplitudes individually, and then and take the collection of them. If you don't fix the helicities, you are basically left with this result, yeah, with uh, Feynman diagrams, and there is nothing which cancels between them. Okay, so this was just motivation, and. Uh, this is already written in terms of different variables, and we will exactly now define what these variables are. Yeah, I wrote some brackets here, which I haven't defined yet. Uh, but before we do it, are, is there any question? More. So this is all so far very motivational things. We haven't really got into the technical part yet, but now we are just about to do it. Okay, so... Uh, so the gluons are massless particles. Uh, as we said in this lecture, we will be mostly interested in massless particles. And, uh, as this Park-Taylor formula already showed, something nice happens if we don't use momenta, but instead of it, we change the variables to to a different set of uh, objects, which, which describe the same thing. So it's just a change of variables. It's not doing anything special, but it will, it will become extremely useful. So uh, the spinner helicity variables is just a different way how to repackage uh, the degrees of freedom in p mu. So we have the four momentum p mu, and instead of the four momentum, we will write it as a pair of two spinners. And to distinguish between these spinners, I call one lambda, the other lambda tilde, and one has, uh, these are uh, spinner indices, they run from one to two, and these are the Pauli matrices, which turn this four component uh, uh, index into a pair of two component indices. So this is repackaging the degrees of freedom here into the two degrees of freedom here. But you will see that this is extremely useful thing to do. Uh, now you can also ask where do these lambda and lambda tilde come from? Well, they originate from solving the massless Dirac equation. Because they are basically solutions to massless Dirac equation. So in momentum uh, representation, the massless Dirac equation can be written like that. And this is uh, the fermionic spin function. And the two independent ones are exactly labeled by these lambda and lambda tilde. So for the, this is our, so here, of course, there are different versions of that. If you have outgoing or incoming fermion, anti-fermion, positive, negative helicity, so this one is actually outgoing anti-fermion, but you can get all the other ones from that. And uh, this has the, then the four component spin function has this lambda tilde into two first uh, slots. This is for plus helicity and then zero. And the V minus has uh, zero, two component zero, and then in the last two component this lambda. And uh, if we write the P using this lambda lambda tilde, then uh, uh, this will automatically satisfy the massless Dirac equation. Yeah? So the, 
the kinematics is labeled by the solutions of the massless Dirac equation. Okay, so this is one way how to look at it. The other way is uh, just a change of variables and uh, instead of uh, writing the four components of P mu in a vector, we will write it in a matrix. Yeah, so that's a different way how to do it, uh, look at it. So, uh, writing P mu, which is P0, P1, P2, P3. We define a matrix PAB, which is, uh, these are again the Pauli matrices, which is just taking P mu and reshuff uh, reshuffling these four degrees of freedom into two by two matrix with labels AB. And uh, the, okay, the explicit formula looks like that. P0, okay. Okay, so these four degrees of freedom, if you do this operation uh, to contract it with these Pauli matrices, you get two by two matrix with the same, uh, with the same, uh, uh, um, the same parameters that go into it, just reshuffled in, uh, in this way. Yes. No, no, it is not. No, no, it is the same. Yeah, yeah. I'm kind of sloppy about uh, these dotted and dotted things here. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So, 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 well, I wanted to do just in a second to see how they are related, but there is no difference. Yes, question. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Here <laughs> we are do using some standard convention. Yeah, so there is uh, this runs from zero, one, two, three. Uh, yeah, and uh, they contracted, uh, yeah, here they are contracted. Yeah, I don't know what are the, well, we can actually get read it off from here. What, what are the explicit, yeah. Uh, yes, question. No, we, we, have, we have here uh, minus, ah, yeah, you, you, you are right. Here is minus. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, here is minus. Ah, sorry, sorry. No, 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 no. P1, uh, uh, we will have, okay, so the P3, the P3 is the time component here, <laughs> sorry. Yeah, uh, we, because once we do it, uh, uh, this will be P3 square minus P3 square plus plus P2 square. Yeah, I think th this will be, well, we will see it just in a second. Yeah, this one will be if we, good, good. So, yeah, so this will be a time component. Sorry, I'm using slightly uh, unusual notation from one of the reviews. Uh, uh, we can also just flip P0 and P3 in, uh, in, this, uh, in this matrix. The important thing is that if you calculate the determinant of uh, this two by two matrix, you get uh, P0 square plus P1 square plus P2 square minus P3 square. which is a p square, sorry, in this notation. Yeah, I guess that having minus here is the most, uh, most common notation. But uh, <coughs> so somebody defined it here with minus sign, and then it propagated through all the other conventions that people are using. But this is p square, and uh, we said that this is m square for on-shell particles, but we have a massless particle, so this is zero. Okay, yes. Oh, sorry, sorry, say it again, please. Uh, here or here? Here. No, no, I'm just saying that this lambda lambda tilde, 
as the spinners, as you can think about it as two component vectors, yeah, but the spinners, they do show up as two components of V plus and V minus, which are solutions to the massless Dirac equation. Here we do, uh, yeah, so we sum, uh, yeah, we sum, uh, so uh, yeah, we sum over those. There is a summation, yeah, yeah, when you have two indices, yeah, we always sum over them. Here, yeah, yeah, yes, yes, yeah, indeed, yeah, indeed. They are also direct matrices. Okay, so, so we started here, P mu. We write it as a matrix uh, with these components. We calculated the determinant of this matrix, and it was zero. So, because the determinant of a two by two matrix is zero for massless particle, otherwise it's m square, not zero, but massless particles, it's zero. Then, we can write uh, PAB as a product of two vectors, lambda A and some kappa B, right? So if the two by two uh, matrix is, uh, has a zero determinant, it has a rank one, not rank two, and we can write it as a product of two vectors like that. And this is exactly what we did over there. We're just changing slightly the notation and uh, we are using the notation uh, for uh, alpha and alpha dot, lambda and lambda tilde. Sorry, up, yeah. Okay, anyway, the result, so, so this is the matrix. Uh, this is uh, just the product of these two two by two matrix, now we can contract it with this sigma to turn it into four component vector. So it's just change of variables, back and forth, and you can either motivate it from this massless Dirac equation, or you can motivate it from writing it like that in a matrix, then determinant is one, and then it factorizes, and I just denote this lambda lambda tilde, uh, the two vectors in which it factorizes. In either case, so this is our new uh, <coughs> way how to, uh, how to store the information about the four momenta. Now, note uh, that uh, for massless uh, momentum, or the momentum of massless particles, oops, the zoom, okay. No question, okay. Uh, we can choose the frame. So now going back to the original uh, four component notation. When we have E, E, zero, E, again here P square equals zero. But this equation is now invariant under the S, uh, SO2 rotation. Yeah, we can rotate here into a different frame. Yeah? So there is an SO2 U1 rotation. Well, that makes all sense, yeah, because uh, we started with saying that we have four degrees of freedom in P mu, but we know that P square is zero. So this is a constraint on these four degrees of freedom. There are actually only three degrees of freedom, not four. Yeah. But this lambda and lambda tilde, each of them have two degrees of freedom. They are two component spinners. So this is four again, two plus two. Yeah. We have to go back down to three, because the P mu has only three. Yeah. And uh, the way how we remove this one degree of freedom uh, I know how this is removed is when we write uh, the redundancy when we wrote p mu sigma so okay so let me be when we were, okay okay i will still write the sigmas for a bit but in the end uh, we just kind of write that p is lambda lambda tilde <laughs> 
there is always this sigma to change these labels into that label. But it will be always here. So if you see, if I write P equals lambda lambda tilde, implicitly here is the sigma. So uh, you can here ask, uh, uh, how do I lose the degree of freedom? What can I do with lambda lambda tilde? What type of transformation equivalence class I can define in order to remove uh, the one degree of freedom, which corresponds to this SO2 rotation. What do you think? Does anybody have any idea? I cannot say that lambda lambda tilde are independent and have four degrees of freedom, because the P only has three degrees of freedom. So, so this, uh, this degree of freedom corresponds to, let's uh, just, uh, uh, multiply lambda by t. And lambda tilde by 1 over t. OK? The product stays the same. Yeah? So this is an equivalence class. Lambda goes to t lambda. Lambda tilde goes to 1 over t lambda. But this t can be a complex number. So this is exactly just the u1. Yeah? It's basically multiplying by e to the i alpha, yeah? complex number. So, uh, so here, the little group of the SO31 for massless particles turn into this transformation. Yeah? So this leaves p mu invariant yeah, where this t is some u1 parameter. And we will always refer to it as the little group transformation, which is, it originates just from this little group transformation here, from the standard SO31 representation. OK, so uh, this is end of our change of variables. So we have p written as lambda lambda tilde. The p is invariant if we rescale lambda and rescale lambda tilde in the opposite way. Now, the amplitudes will be not invariant, as we will see later, if we do this transformation. But the momentum is invariant. Yeah, the momentum is invariant. Yeah, for any complex, it's a complex number. Well, it's a complex number, so we can think about it as, yeah, this is a number, right? It's not a matrix. It's not U2 or... It's one complex degree of freedom, yeah. Yeah, but with a complex, you can think of it as a complex way. E to the i alpha, where alpha is complex, right? Then, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, so sorry. So, okay, so we are getting to an important thing, because so far, the our momenta p mu are complex, yeah, in this representation. We haven't said anything about reality, yeah? So... Uh, so far, nothing forces us to say that uh, the momenta are real. Uh, here we can deal with complex momenta. So it has three complex degrees of freedom, not three real degrees of freedom. But of course, in the real world, the momenta are real. Yeah? The kinematics is real. Uh, so. Uh, So in the real world, p mu is real. So if we do a complex conjugate of p mu, we should get the same thing. But now, doing that, this will relate lambda and lambda tilde. Here we said that they are independent, lambda and lambda tilde, each of them describing two complex degrees of freedom. These two complex degrees of freedom, these two, with this transformation, back to three complex degrees of freedom, which is all fine. And uh, you will see later that thinking about complex momenta is extremely useful. But if we want to go back to the real world when the momenta are real, we have to impose this condition. And it will relate lambda tilde as the complex conjugate of lambda. Yeah, so it will basically tell you that there is only, only one of them is independent. If we want real momenta, 
if we want complex momenta, they are independent. Yeah, so for real, for complex mu, they are independent. Uh, for complex p. Okay, but we will work with complex momenta here. Yeah. Uh, there will be already something very important when we start to calculate three point amplitudes, because three point uh, amplitudes are all zero if we only restrict ourselves to real momenta, but they become non zero if the momenta are complex. We will, of course, we don't observe three point amplitudes of massless particles in the real world, but they will become an important building blocks for calculating higher point amplitudes. So uh, maybe I can pause here for more questions. We have seven minutes left, but if there are no questions, I can continue for a bit. But let's pause for questions now. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, we have complex momenta. It's a complexified version of that, yeah. Uh, well, uh, yeah, we, we, we kind of do complex rotation here, yeah. So, uh, uh, True, true, yeah. So, so, so here we don't have only phase, but uh, yeah, we, we have a real one complex degree of freedom that we have to remove, yeah, complex number to remove, yeah, right. Yeah, sorry, because yeah, this thing with the groups is real, it's in principle tied to the real, real thing, but yeah, I know we are now saying that actually what we want to do is complex, yeah, so if you do real, yeah, you are right, yeah, that's true. More questions? So, if any questions by Zoom? This is four dimensional. Very good, very good. That's very important. This is only works in four dimensions. Yeah. There are certain things which you can do in three and six, but it's restricted. This, this particular thing is restricted to four. In general, there is a, uh, if you use momenta, you can work in any number of dimensions. It's not restricted to dimensions. So if you want to calculate scattering in seven dimensions, you are only left with momenta. Yeah, so all the magic that we will see later will not apply to higher dimensions, yeah, or at least most of it. Yeah. You at least you cannot change the variables. Yeah. This thing is four dimensions. There is a certain extension to six dimensions when instead of the lambda, lambda, tilde, two component, you use three component. But everything is basically related to the relation between groups, yeah, because you have SO31, and here you have SU2 cross SU2. And if this factorization of the Lorentz group works, then you can use it. You, you basically can, instead of for, um, momentum, you can use some spinners. Yeah? But if there is no factorization, you cannot use it. You are stick with the momentum. Yeah? In four dimensions, we have this nice coincidence that everything works. You can also make it work in three dimensions with like extra constraint, and in six dimensions, but in general dimensions not. Yeah? But we will only discuss four dimensions here. So yes, it is restricted to four dimensions. More questions? Yes. Yes, so, so the, yes, well, that, that, that's how it's used. Yeah, so the idea is uh, you do all calculations in four, and then uh, when you do these integrals, which we will not do here because we only do three level, but let's say that you do one loop and you wanted to uh, uh, calculate these integrals, they are divergent, you have to regulate them, so you have to shift the dimensionality from 4 to 4 minus epsilon. So, 
you have to say what is your epsilon component of, uh, of these momenta. Yeah? So you have to kind of add uh, this information about this momenta. In, uh, well, most of the time, the way how it's calculated is that there is some analytic continuation of from 4 to 4 minus epsilon of these integral formulas. Yeah. But, uh, but yes, in principle, there is something called mu terms in the amplitude, which exactly correspond to this extra, even if we only add epsilon more, yeah, there is some extra piece uh, that the you get from the kinematics outside of four dimensions. Yes? So uh, can, I will can do you only try three to level. repeat the question. Yeah, so, so there was a question about uh, what about loops? Yeah, will that be a lecture on the loop? So I will only cover the three level, despite maybe in the end I will say a little bit about loops, but uh, Tzvi's lecture will be on uh, the generalized unitarity, unitarity methods for loop amplitudes. Yeah, I guess mostly at one loop. Yeah, but uh, yeah, it has kind of several, the loop, the calculations of loops have. Uh, more parts. The first part is to get formulas for the integrand, the things that you will go, you will integrate, and the second part is the integration. While at three we have no integration, so we only get the rational function, which you can get as a sum of Feynman diagrams on one side, but we will get it in a different way using some other methods. Yeah. At loops, you have to also then do the loop integration afterwards. Yeah. More questions? So I had a question. Um, yeah. So you say you can get rid of infrared divergences. You can essentially ignore them because uh, you know, I well, just had the question, which is some theories relate infrared in ultraviolet, like in string theory. So what, what is the subtlety? Uh, how do you resolve that subtlety? So, OK, so my statement here was following. Yeah, so we can regulate the IR divergences. Uh, and they have some prescribed structure, let's say, in gauge theories. And uh, we know how this IR part looks like. They are very constrained, the way how the IR divergences appear. So my claim was just despite the thing is formally divergent, we know that the IR divergent has a particular form. So it's still reasonable to consider this divergent object. Now, they, in the end, indeed, they cancel in the cross-section. Uh, the soft and the virtual emission should cancel. So if you want to really see the cancellation of IR divergences, you have to do one step after the amplitude to go to the cross-section. Now, there are other people, also more recently, who tried to define already IR finite amplitude in the first place, not like relying on this cancellation in the cross-section, but for that you cannot consider just external states of single particles. You have to consider clouds of massless states, yeah, it's called it Padyev Kulish and uh, so on. So you can define the amplitude in that way, and it will be IR finite. However, uh, it's not a practical. <laughs> the more practical way is to keep the divergences in the game because we know how they look like, yeah. But I would say theoretically, it's interesting to even define the IR finite amplitude, but for that you have, to, you have to consider this soft emission. You have to say that instead of just one external massless particle, you have a whole cloud because a lot of things can, uh, uh, can be created at very low momenta. Yeah. So my question is, so in, in string theory, the IR and the ultraviolet are related, right? Because yeah, no, here they are not, so, yeah. So, but, so what would have, what's the analog of the cloud for the, if you do the ultraviolet? In the string, yeah. uh, no, I think that like, uh, from the field theory here, the ultraviolet is just sick. Yeah, so once we have ultraviolet, uh, you have to do, you have to add counter terms, you have to but cancel you see them. Contradiction, right? In string theory, if you have an infrared, you have an ultraviolet and vice versa. R true, true. <laughs> uh, right, right. Yeah, no, uh, yeah, here, well, the only kind of, but that's at the technical level, that's nothing fundamental. There are certain cases when IR and UV uh, kind of talk to each other and they cancel each other. Okay. But uh, yeah, th this is different. There are certain integrals which are both IR and UV divergent, but the divergences cancel and they are finite. But this is a complete artifact. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, other questions? So here we have just one particle states. Uh, 
Uh, there are people who calculate scattering of bound states, but uh, for that you have to, yeah, you have to, you you need to deal with these external states in a different way. Yeah, so you have to. Uh, well, even this thing with hadrons, right? So so you calculate scattering of gluons and quarks, and then you have to turn them into hadrons. And for that, you have to use some uh, part on distribution functions, something which tells you how you combine them, how you confine them back. But this is something we don't know how to calculate in perturbation theory. Yeah. So these are things which we get from non-perturbative QCD, from lattice, from experiments. Yeah, these are just too hard things because they need, they, they exactly are in the strongly coupled regime. Yeah, when uh, this thing doesn't work. Yeah. Well, with black holes, it's a little different, but you, I guess you will have lectures on that next week. You can treat black hole as just a particle, <laughs> and then you can scatter massive particles now, massive particles with spin. Yeah. And in the first approximation, you just treat them as one particle states. Yeah. There's a question on Zoom. Zoom question? Ah, okay, good, good, very good question, but very kind of complex one. <laughs> Can you calculate uh, loop amplitudes from tree level amplitudes? Uh, yes, in principle, and in certain special theories also in practice. Uh, we will discuss in my lecture about tree level recursion relations, how to take lower point amplitude and turn them into higher point amplitude, yeah, how to take three three point, four point amplitude and calculate five point from that without starting from scratch. And you can also do it with loops. You can take three amplitudes and basically take some of the external states and close them into a loop. However, at the moment we only know how to work in certain theories because in most of the theories this procedure is kind of divergent. Yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, in principle, if we figure out how to do it also in other theories, yes. Uh, but at the moment, we know how to do it just for n equals 4 super young males. Uh, uh, yeah, theories with uh, supersymmetries, n equals 1 super young males at one loop, let's say. Uh, but uh, in principle, yes, the loop amplitudes, there is enough information in tree level amplitudes to turn it into loop amplitudes. But even that is before this integration. It's the thing that is the integrand, the function that then you have to integrate. Yeah because the tree-level amplitudes know nothing about integrating over the loop momentum. Then you have to specify the contour. You have to say you are integrating over Minkowski, and uh, this is something you have to inject into the problem. Yes? Ah, so uh, th there are, s I, I sent also uh, the notes. Uh, some, uh, no so there, there is a, okay, maybe I will just mention there is one book on uh, amplitudes by L1 and Huang. It's a book, but it's also on archive. <laughs> so you can also download it. And this is most of the basic things. Uh, and there are also other lecture notes uh, by Lance Dixon, Clifford Cheng, Johannes Hen, which have some of the basic uh, things as well, but they are a little smaller. This book is kind of the most, uh, uh, yeah, the, the biggest reference material, yeah, which discusses, yeah, also the things that I discussed here today. So uh, all the lectures, so the notes are on the web page, and the lectures are recorded and will be on the web page also. So I should say people okay. on Zoom, they can open their microphone if they want. They don't have to send by chat, especially in this period, if you want. Okay, so okay. no more questions. I think we have a coffee break now. Okay, thank you for questions. Great, thank you.